Well, greetings once again. In this segment, we are going to talk about what's involved in writing a gospel, and we're also going to look more closely at the synoptic relationships. What's the relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke? So to start with, I'm going to share my screen with you, and we're going to take a look at Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and you should have it in front of you now on the screen. But I'll go ahead and read it. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, what I want you to notice here is that Luke is acknowledging right off the bat that he's not the first to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished. In other words, Luke acknowledges that he is not the first to write a gospel. He is not the first to put in narrative form uh, the story of Jesus and his death and resurrection. So Luke acknowledges that, that he's not the first one to do this, and he's actually going to make use of what others have done. Second thing I want you to notice, uh, verse 2, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word uh, have delivered them to us. So Luke also acknowledges that he's not an eyewitness, but there were those who were from the beginning who were eyewitnesses, and that this word, uh, both the narrative and the report of the witnesses, has been delivered to us. Luke is a recipient of the Jesus tradition, if I can say it that way. Uh, so Luke himself was not one of the eyewitness followers of Jesus, uh, but rather Luke is receiving the tradition that has been handed down to him, has been delivered to him. And that tradition has come in the form of written narratives and also eyewitness accounts. And what Luke is going to do, notice verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past. So Luke has been attending to this closely. He's doing his research well. He is going to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke is pulling together the eyewitness accounts, the oral tradition. He's pulling together written accounts, narratives that he has received. And he is putting it together in an orderly fashion for a guy by the name of Theophilus. Now, we'll talk about Theophilus more later on when we begin to get more deeply into Luke, but right now I want you to notice that Luke is writing for a particular person or a particular audience, and he has a purpose, an agenda, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And so, so when we think about Luke in relation to Matthew and Mark, Luke is already admitting that he's not first, and he's also admitting that he's pulling together uh, from other sources and written as well as oral tradition or oral sources, if you want to say it that way, and he is compiling it into an orderly account for a particular audience with a particular agenda. So keep that in mind. Now I'm going to share another screen with you. And we're going to take a look at, let's see, where did it go? Uh, synoptic parallels. So I've had you do this work already in terms of particular passages, uh, comparing and contrasting particular passages within Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I'm sure that you've recognized that Mark writes with a lot of detail typically, that Luke is typically pretty detailed and very close to Mark, and that Matthew writes with less detail. There's a few places where he might have more detail, but in general, Matthew tends to condense things, okay, and, and get to the point more quickly. So here we have kind of lined out Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we have, you know, we start at the same place in the story where Jesus is healing the paralytic. Uh, this is the guy that they dug a hole through the roof, and Jesus saw the faith of his friends, and he tells the man, your sins are forgiven, and then he knows that everybody's questioning who is Jesus to forgive sins. And so he heals the guy to demonstrate his authority. 
So they all start at the same place, but notice in Mark's gospel, this is the first story of chapter two that is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. One of the, one of the first things, not the first thing, but one of the first things that Mark tells us about. Okay, Matthew, we're at the beginning of chapter nine, that Jesus has already preached the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five, six, and seven. He's done other miracles in chapter eight. And now finally we get to chapter nine and Jesus heals the paralytic. Uh, Luke, more close to Mark, uh, front of Jesus' ministry. We don't have a whole lot of teaching that has taken place yet. Uh, Jesus heals the paralytic. Then we go to the next story in Mark, the calling of Levi, Matthew, the calling of Levi. Um, and then Luke, we see that. Questions about fasting. And then we have Mark, or excuse me, Matthew placing the miracles where Jesus heals the dead girl and the sick woman. And, and those occur in Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8. So they all have them, but Matthew has kind of front loaded them, if you will, in terms of his narrative for Mark. You know, they're coming way down here on the other side of the parable of the sower. And Luke follows Mark in terms of including that, mir that miracle on the other side of the parable of the sower. Matthew also has Jesus healing a deaf mute person, um, teachings about how the workers are few. Jesus sends out the 12 in Matthew 10. That's going to come later in Luke. And then we have the story of John the Baptist and questions about him, whereas that's in chapter 11. Uh, Luke actually has that down here in chapter 7, uh, kind of a big difference in terms of placement. Um, Mark doesn't exactly have that same material. And eventually they all get back together. Matthew kind of rejoins the narrative scheme of Luke when Jesus is questioned about the Sabbath and healing on the Sabbath and Lord of the Sabbath. And then we have the appointing of the 12 and eventually uh, Jesus is accused of healing demons or casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Now notice here, this is where Luke adds in stuff that Mark doesn't have. And so this Sermon on the Plain in chapter 6 is very similar to the Sermon on the Mount, which Matthew would have up here before he ever gets to these accounts of the miracles. And so same material, pretty much, but in a different location. Uh, we have the miracle of Jesus healing the faith of the centurion. Uh, again, Matthew has that, but it's back up here in chapter 8. And then they eventually kind of get back on track. Uh, well, the raising of the widow's son, and then question uh, from Jesus' mothers and brothers, you know, wanting to take Jesus, and then, and uh, then finally, you know, the parable of the sower, and they're all back on track. So just what I want you to see is that when Matthew deviates from Mark, at the very place he deviates from Mark, he deviates from Luke. And then I also want you to see wherever Luke deviates from Mark, at that place that he deviates from Mark, he also deviates from Matthew. Okay, everybody seeing that? That when Matthew deviates from Mark, he deviates from Luke. And when Luke deviates from Mark, he also deviates from Matthew. So that would move us to believe that Mark is the one who has provided the basic narrative framework and that Matthew and Luke are both making use of Mark. And so whenever Matthew shifts away from Mark, at that point, he's shifting away from Luke as well. And whenever Luke shifts away from Mark, at that point, we see that he has also moved away from Matthew. So that's what causes scholars to believe that Mark is kind of the baseline gospel that Luke is making use of and that Matthew also is making use of. Uh, let me show you one other one. So here we are working with uh, the account in Jerusalem. So we started at this entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem on the donkey. This occurs in Matthew 21. It's in Mark 11 and Luke 19. And so Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey. You can see that all three gospels, he goes to the temple first. But notice that in Mark, the next day, he goes to the temple. And he curses the, the next day, he curses the fig tree and he clears out the temple. 
And then for Matthew and Luke, that happens on the same day, the clearing of the temple. And then we have on uh, the tree is withered. By the way, Luke doesn't have the account of Jesus cursing the fig tree, but that is in Matthew as well. And we get some lessons on that. Then we have the authority of Jesus question and Jesus responds. You know, the question is, where did you get the authority to do these things to clear the temple out? And Jesus responds with his own question. So notice they're all lined up again. And then Matthew has a parable that's missing from Mark and Luke. Then we get lined up again in terms of the parable of the tenants. And then Matthew has another parable to quote unquote splice in. And then we get the questions about paying taxes to Caesar, marriage at the resurrection. We get the greatest commandment. Again, Luke doesn't have that here. And so we have but Matthew following along. And then Jesus teaching about whose son is the Christ. And then we get the seven woes that Jesus announces in Matthew that is missing in Mark and Luke. We get the widow's offering that's recorded in Matthew and, excuse me, in Mark and Luke that Matthew leaves out. And then we get the signs of the end. And then we get in Matthew three parables about being prepared for the return of Christ. Again, all I'm trying to get you to see is that whenever Matthew deviates from Mark, uh, at that place, he deviates also from Luke. And we can also say the same thing, that wherever Luke deviates from Mark, he deviates from Matthew. Here it's in terms of leaving something out. So all of this moves scholars to conclude that Mark is most likely the baseline gospel that both Luke and Matthew are working from. Now, I noted, and you should have seen this in your work, that there are things that Matthew and Luke have in common that Mark does not have, okay, that's missing from Mark. And so that raises the question, okay, if they didn't get it from Mark because Mark doesn't have it, then where did they get it from? And so, for example, the healing of the uh, centurion servant or the faith of the centurion. It's in, it's in chapter seven here of Luke. And then as noted, Matthew has it, but it's before we get into this sequence. And so Matthew has it up in chapter eight. Uh, that would be one example. Another example, the Sermon on the Plain, all of these teachings of Jesus, sayings of Jesus, even a set of Beatitudes here looks very similar to the Sermon on the Mount but Matthew has that up in chapters five to seven. And so the question is, how do Matthew and Luke have virtually the same material, but they put it in different places in their gospel? They're following Mark along, and then they have this other material, and they splice it in in different places. So the thinking is that that comes from what's referred to as Q. So let me, let me stop the screen share and go to the board here. If I can figure out how to do this. I didn't want to do that. I'll go over here. Okay, now we're back. So, so let me go ahead and try to diagram this as we work on synoptic relationships. So the general diagram looks something like this, where here we have Mark. And Mark has priority in terms of being the first gospel written. Underneath here, we'll put Matthew. I'm just going to abbreviate Matthew, MT, and Luke over here, LK. Almost all of Mark is included in Matthew. And so we draw an arrow down like this to indicate that we're going to find Mark as the primary source for Matthew. And almost all of Mark is found in Luke. Okay, so what these arrows indicate is that Mark serves as a source for Matthew and Luke. And again, almost the whole of Mark is found in Matthew. Most of it is found in Luke. So it looks like both Matthew and Luke, or the writers of these Gospels, are making use of the Gospel of Mark to provide their base narrative, their base account of Jesus and his ministry. With me so far? This would explain why we find so much that's almost verbatim in Matthew and Luke that, what, that's in Mark. Now, the thinking is that because Mark writes in greater detail, that Mark was probably written first and that Matthew is condensing Mark. 
Okay, there are some scholars who would push that the opposite direction that Mark is making use of Matthew. Okay, but the general consensus is that the tendency would be to eliminate details rather than to add details, to fill in with details. That Mark's details are pretty vivid, such as the feeding of the 5,000, you know, they, Jesus had them sit down on the green grass, such as digging the hole through the roof so that they could drop the paralyzed man down through on his mat. I mean, very vivid details. Okay, so the thinking is that Mark is written first and that Matthew and Luke make use of Mark and Luke, pretty detailed like Mark, Matthew has a tendency to eliminate those details because he wants to get really quick to the point. Okay, so the story, I think I had you read this. Well, I know you read it if you did your reading about the synagogue rulers, uh, Jairus, his daughter dying. Okay, well, in Mark, she is dying. And then Jesus is on his way. You get the woman with the flow of blood that touches Jesus' robe. He stops, has a conversation with her. And then they get word that the little girl has died, that it's kind of too late. And Jesus tells the father, you know, just believe it's going to be okay. And they go on. Well, in Matthew, that's all eliminated to where the dad goes to Jesus in Matthew and says, my, my daughter has died. She's already dead. So Matthew is really kind of getting to the point quickly that Jesus is going to raise her from the dead, whereas Mark, it's a much slower story. It's a much detailed story. I mean, it's, it's fast paced in terms of the detail and the involvement, but he's slower to get to the point of resurrection that she's dying and then the news comes that she's dead. So because of things like that, the general consensus is that Mark is written first and that Matthew is making use of Mark and then also Luke making use of Mark. Now, the material that Matthew and Luke share, most people think that instead of saying that Luke is copying Matthew at that point or Matthew copying Luke at that point, the general theory is that there's another source that's abbreviated as Q. And Q is short for the German word Hala, which means source. And the Germans came up with this hypothesis to where Matthew and Luke are making use of a source known as that, that they're going to name Q, and that this source would be a list of the teachings of Jesus. So it's called a saying source. And so Luke uses it, Matthew uses it. I talk a little bit about this in terms of some of the stuff in Matthew. Uh, you know, what might the Logia be that the disciple Matthew recorded in Aramaic and everybody translated well as they could. So, so this is where that comes into play in terms of this hypothesis of Q, that Matthew and Luke have stuff in common that's almost verbatim, word for word, like the Sermon on the Plain versus the Sermon on the Mount. And so how do you explain that? And so one of the explanations, maybe the leading explanation is that Matthew and Luke are drawing upon a source that we don't have it. Uh, it's just a hypothesis. No one has ever found a written document that would explain this. Okay, but it's, it's a hypothesis to try to make sense of how they have stuff in common. And so not only are they drawing from Mark, but they're also making use of Q. And Q would be a saying source. So kind of not a narrative form, but kind of a list. Uh, the different things that Jesus said and taught. And then they're going to pull from that list that doesn't really have a narrative framework or narrative context. They're going to pull from that list and they're going to splice it into different places in their gospel where they feel like it makes the most sense and helps them kind of achieve their agenda with their particular audience in view. Okay, so if I could illustrate it this way, and this probably isn't the greatest illustration, but maybe it will be helpful. So here we have our basic narrative, A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, so you got the narrative framework you're moving through here. And then you have this added source or resource. And so we'll call it, you know, kind of star, asterisk, box, triangle, something like that, to where it's not really a narrative, it's just a list of sayings or a list of symbols. 
Okay, so we have these sayings of Jesus, you know, the star saying, the asterisk saying, the box saying, the triangle saying, and then we got this narrative. Okay, well, because this is a list and I'm taking over this narrative, then I can pull from this list and splice stuff in anywhere I want. Okay, so I might, I might end up with A, B, uh, triangle, box, C, D, asterisk, star, and then finally get to F. Okay, I might splice it in that way that that really helps me kind of develop my argument, let's say for Theophilus, so that he can be certain of everything that he's received as part of the tradition. Okay, I'm Matthew and I'm writing for a different group. And so writing for Jewish believers. And so I might construct my narrative something like this, that I have A, B, C, and then I get, you know, star, asterisk, uh, triangle, and then D, E, uh, box, and then F. Okay, and so I might set it up that way because I think this will speak more clearly to my audience. Okay, and so you can see that this is kind of what we have in terms of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so scholars say, okay, well, what's, how do they get the same stuff, but in different places? Ah, they must be drawing from a common source. And they must have the freedom to rearrange it because it's not in a narrative format, it's simply in a framework uh, of sayings, a list of sayings. And so that kind of explains, you know, the relationship of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in terms of kind of a, one of the leading hypotheses uh, about the whole thing. Now, let me erase this real quick. Got a couple more things to want to demonstrate. Well, before I erase it, you probably have noticed in your reading also that one of the things that can happen is that where we have E over here right before F, that maybe in Mark, or excuse me, in Matthew, it might be A, B, E, C. Or Luke might have A, B, C, E, D, F. And so there might be a particular event that they all three have, but they put it in a different location in their narrative. And so the writers have some freedom to do that. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay, let me erase this. Okay, so now we're... Okay, so now we're back to our basic, you know, explanation, if you will, diagram of the relationship of, of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, there's a couple of other items to put up here to kind of get the full picture. And so one is that there's stuff in Matthew that isn't in Mark or Luke. And so to kind of fill out the diagram, scholars will kind of put another arrow up here. And here we have special Matthew. Okay, this is material that only Matthew had access to, like the birth narrative with the Magi from the East, or maybe the fulfillment quotations. Okay, so material that only Matthew has that we don't find in Luke, and so if Luke doesn't have it, and only Matthew has it, uh, probably didn't come from Q, just came from Matthew's special resources. Okay, and then same thing with Luke. But there would be special Luke material that only Luke has, maybe that he gathered from his research, like the birth accounts in terms of Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John the Baptist, and the birth account of Jesus in the stable, that that's Luke's special material. We don't find that in Matthew. We don't think it belonged to Q, and Matthew just left it out, uh, that it's his special material. So that's kind of a, a source perspective that... Mark is the first gospel written, and we might fill this in that where did Mark get his material from? He got it from Peter. So Peter is the eyewitness account that Mark makes use of, and then Matthew makes use of Mark, Luke makes use of Mark. They also make use of Q, this same source that is reflective of the teachings of Jesus. Again, it's hypothetical, nobody's ever found such a document but it's, it's hypothetical. And then, uh, but it's a good hypothesis at one level. And then they have their special material. Okay, I hope that's making sense to you. Now, one other thing to consider. Uh, 
The biggest weakness with this, aside from Q never being found, the biggest weakness of this is that it's kind of docu a document theory. Okay, it assumes that Matthew and Luke are working from documents, that they got the document of Mark, they have the document of Q, they have these other documents, and then they're, they're pulling these documents together and creating their particular narrative, Matthew and Luke. Okay, well, it was an oral world, not a document world. Okay, we live in a document slash digital culture where we tend to think of everything being in writing and then you know, we pull that writing together, we cut and paste, we edit whatnot and produce a new document, okay, from old documents. Okay, but there, what they weren't in so much of a document world, theirs was an oral culture. And so most people knew the Gospel of Mark, not because they had a copy of the Gospel of Mark, but because they had heard the Gospel of Mark read to them. Okay, maybe even preach to them. So you didn't have the printing press in existence. Uh, and so, you know, most people did not have, you know, a, a written text, whether it's Mark or whether it's the whole Old Testament. Most people become familiar with the Gospel of Mark because your church has a copy of it and you've heard it read. Or people at your church have heard it read and now they're preaching it. And so you're hearing it before you're actually reading it. And maybe you never read it, you only hear it. The same thing with Q, which would be the teachings of Jesus. And so Q looks very much like an account of the teachings of Jesus, that we don't think from what we find in Matthew and Luke, that Q would have included a narrative of account of Jesus' death and resurrection. The Q was simply what Jesus taught, and you don't have the occasion of the teaching, just the teachings. Okay, well, maybe instead of Q actually being a document, maybe Q is just oral tradition, that Jesus taught a lot of the same stuff on a lot of different occasions, and so now you have this kind of body, if you will, of oral tradition that people have heard and learned, and now you have Matthew and Luke not drawing upon a written document, but drawing upon a common oral tradition of Jesus' teachings. And those teachings made such an impact on people that as they began to practice those teachings and to share those teachings, then you kind of have this almost kind of fixed but fluid uh, tradition of the things that Jesus taught and the things that Jesus did as the stories get told. And oral tradition, we tend to see it in our culture as kind of negative, that you can't rely upon it. And that's not really the case in their culture, their times, that oral tradition was, was reliable because it belonged to the community. I know that many of you have probably played the game telephone at some point where you got, a, you know, you're in a room with a bunch of people and you're going to play this game and somebody starts out whispering in somebody's ear. Of course, you wouldn't do that now during COVID-19, but, you know, in the old days, you would whisper in somebody's ear a uh, sentence or something, and then they'd whisper to somebody else and they'd whisper it to somebody else. And by the time it comes all the way back around, you know, it's changed drastically. Okay, but why? Well, because it's been whispered. Whereas if something is presented in public, yeah, you might have some slight variations in terms of what's heard, but the community kind of owns it. And the community will kind of work out what was said. And the next person that kind of passes it on, you know, well, they have to tell it in such a way that it fits or the community is going to reject it and say, no, that's not what was said. That's not what was taught. And so oral tradition is very communal rather than individualistic. And the storytellers or the preachers, they are accountable to the community as well as to the tradition to pass it on in a way that's faithful. And yes, they'll appropriate it for new occasions and different purposes, but they still have to tell it in such a way that they're faithful to the tradition and the community will hold them accountable. Okay, so if I preached on Palm Sunday, 
that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on this white war horse. You know, nobody's going to let me get away with that because everybody knows the tradition. Okay. And so I, I would be free to say it would be like taking a, it'd be like taking a taxi, you know, donkey, a beast of burden. It'd be like taking a taxi into Jerusalem or something like that. But if I were to say it was today, it'd be like taking a limo into Jerusalem. Nah, nobody would buy that. Okay. A, uh, a donkey is a beast of burden. Nobody's going to identify a limo as a beast of burden. Okay, so you can see how you can appropriate the tradition, how there's a fluidity to it, but there's also a fixedness. And so oral tradition is reliable. And so maybe instead of working with such a written document theory, we need to think more orally. And that would be how you have some of the variation that we find in Matthew and Luke, as well as Mark, where we get the same story, but maybe slightly different emphases, maybe adapted to a particular audience. And so maybe it's not that they're working from, you know, Q, a document that's a list of Jesus sayings, as much as they're working from a tradition of what Jesus said, what Jesus taught, what Jesus did. And that gives them the freedom to kind of adapt it, splice it in, tell it with their own particular emphases, but in a way that's faithful to the story, to the teaching. Okay, so we're covering lots of stuff here. So hopefully that kind of helps you a little bit in terms of thinking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke and their relationship to each other, and also kind of understanding this document hypothesis theory and why the theory came up, but also what's kind of weak about it, that it was an oral culture, an oral world, not a world of everybody having access to documents uh, to where they can simply copy and cut and paste. Okay, so next thing we want to talk about, and I know I'm kind of dumping a lot on you really quick here in this lecture, but we want to talk about what goes into writing a gospel. So let me uh, get this off the board. And this is pretty common sense, but it's helpful to kind of spell it out. If you're going to write a gospel, whether you're Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or eventually John, which we'll look at the last week of our class, you're going to have to, first of all, you're going to have to select. So one, you're going to have to select what you're going to include in your gospel. That Jesus did so much stuff that there's no way you're going to be able to collect it all and include it all in your gospel. There's just not room for it. So you're going to have to decide what it is that you are going to tell about Jesus, what teachings you want to make sure you communicate, which stories you want to make sure that you get across. And so if we think back with Mark and taking the, the preaching of Peter, Mark is going to have to make decisions about Peter's preaching. And, you know, no doubt he's heard countless sermons. He's going to have to make decisions about what to include and what, okay, I don't need to include this because I've already got this. Okay, and same thing with Matthew and Luke, same thing with John, and John admits as much, that Jesus did so much stuff that there's no way to include it, that all the things that Jesus did would fill all the books of the world. So gospel writer, first thing you got to do is you have to select about what you're going to talk about. Okay, number two, uh, second thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to arrange it. So you're going to have to figure out what order do I tell all this in? Okay, and so you're going to try to give some order to it. We see Luke acknowledge that, that he's taking everything that he's received and he's trying to order it. And so Matthew and Luke, it looks like they take common material, whether it's from a document or oral tradition, and they arrange it differently. And so Matthew puts it into five major teaching blocks, whereas Luke has it more scattered. Okay, and even some of the things that they all three have in common, we find in a different location within the narrative. And so you're going to have to make decisions about how you're going to arrange the material. Okay, and then finally, you're also going to adapt it to your audience, to your community. And so the Gospels were not written in a vacuum. The, the Gospels were not written uh, for, you know, nobody. 
the Gospels, we believe, were written for particular communities, churches. You know, Luke says he's writing for Theophilus. It looks very much like Matthew is writing for Jewish believers. Uh, the tradition is that Mark is writing for the church at Rome. And so you take the stories of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and you, you select, you arrange, you adapt. You can't transgress the, the tradition. Um, people will hold you accountable for that. The stories of Jesus are well known. But you take them and you adapt them for your particular readership, uh, what you're trying to help them do in terms of following Jesus. Okay, maybe this isn't uh, the best example, but if, if I ask you, you know, and we were face to face and I'd say, you know, tell me, tell me about your weekend. What did you do this past weekend? Okay, well, you're going to start out by telling me about how you have just been anticipating this New Testament class and now you spend all your time uh, reading the New Testament and watching the lectures and they're so good that you watch them twice and you even invite your parents to watch them with you and you invite your friends over to watch these New Testament lectures with you and uh, you watch the New Testament lectures all weekend long. And then if you get a little bit of extra time, you might Zoom church and then you might do some laundry and you might get a little bit of free time where you catch a sunset. I don't know. You know, but, but that's what you're going to tell me, okay? And so you're very selective about what you're doing, and you arrange it in a particular way, and you're adapting the whole thing to me. Uh, is any of it untrue? No, you're, you're telling the truth, okay? But you're making choices as you tell. And then your mom says, okay, you know, tell me, you know, what, what did you do this past weekend? And you're going to start off with her, Maybe about, well, you'll probably tell her how you watch your New Testament lectures, but then you'll talk about, well, you got your laundry done and you got your grocery shopping done and you made it out to, uh, you, you Zoom for church and whatever, you know, but you're going to have what mom wants to hear. And then your best friend from home is going to, or if you're at home, your best friend, I don't know, from wherever, from, from Loma, going to going to ask you what you do this weekend. And you're going to start talking about what you did on Friday night and the fun that you had or whatever. Okay, do you, do you kind of get the picture that you are constantly arranging things and selecting material and adapting it to who you're talking to? And is any of it untrue? No, it's all true, but you're not going to give a chronology of everything that you did starting at 5.30 Friday and running through 6 a.m. Monday morning. You're not gonna do that. You don't have the space to do it. Nobody wants to hear all that anyways. And so, and that's not what the question really is. Okay, and so writing a gospel, you're not trying to give us an absolute chronology of everything that Jesus said and did. Okay, impossible to do it. Okay, but what they're doing is they're selecting, okay, if you're gonna get Jesus, you gotta get this. You know, if you're gonna know how my weekend went, I gotta tell you about this. Okay, if you're going to get Jesus, these are the stories, these are the teachings that you have to get. No room to include at all, but if you get this, you get Jesus. Okay, and you're going to arrange it a particular way for who you're writing for, the community that you're trying to encourage in the faith and help grow stronger. And you're going to adapt those stories, those teachings, not in a way that transgresses them so that somehow you're being false or untrue, but rather that you are kind of faithfully applying them to your community to help them grow. So a gospel writer, you have Jesus in view, and you have your audience in view, and you are selecting and arranging and adapting so that your audience can better learn Jesus, who he is, and how to follow him. Okay, so I hope that helps you. Uh, we'll probably talk a little bit more about this in terms of our understanding of Scripture as the inspired Word of God, but I'll sign this one off, and I think we might save that discussion for the next week. All right, enjoy.